I'm Holly. I'm Leslie. And we would be dead. Leslie. Hey, Holly. Hey, fiends. We have take two on yes. this one today. <laughs> Oops. Uh, yeah, hopefully you guys all read our posts on social media. Actually, Leslie's posts on social media. Mm-hmm. She was kind enough to do them all this week. Yeah, well, it was my problem. No. <laughs> Explaining that we did have some technical difficulties last week and we we did record. We did. We sure did it. We did it. Just, uh, didn't didn't land on the recorder. So. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we told, Leslie told me a story and I listened and responded and then that's where it ended. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to give it another shot now. Uh, so we have part two of our spring break story swap for you guys this week with a spring break in the middle. So there you go. Oh, it made sense. You're welcome. We planned it that way. <laughs> <laughs> and it is Leslie's turn. Yes, it is. Yay! Again. <laughs> Again. And boy, howdy, did she pick a big one. I really did. You did. Did you know? No. <laughs> you know. You told me that you were going to do this. And I was like, wow, she's feeling very ambitious. Every, okay, I usually can tell like, oh, I could do this case. It's like, because knowing I'll probably, and we would be dead fashion. We'll probably expand it more. Of course. Because I'll be like, wait, why didn't they talk about this part? This is the interesting part yeah. of the case. So it'll be like another 15, 20 minutes on top of it. And so every, every other um, telling of this is well below an hour. Yeah, it's not. It's so big. And then any, so then, and that was me. I only listened to like one person cover it. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. And I like turned it off halfway through. Oh no. And then I like went and was reading about it. And again, they're just like short little things, but I was gra- I was getting like little extra pieces from each yeah. thing. And then I was, as I was doing the case though, I was like, oh my God. <laughs> it's big. It's big and it's told so many different ways. So it's And it's hard. famous. Oh God, it's huge. This was... <sighs> well, Leslie, why don't you tell our audience what case you picked? Okay. So I am doing Mark Kilroy. Um, it's about his disappearance and his murder over spring break 1989. Right. Now, anybody who is like a diehard true crime person or even just is aware of the news from the 80s is going to mm-hmm. be like, oh, shit. Oh, God. So, <laughs> yeah, that one. Yeah. All right. It's like a case right up my alley, but like, oh, my gosh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and given the size and nature of Leslie's case, she had to spend a little more time in the dark reading about Satan than she usually does this mm-hmm. this week these past few weeks, but like just a little more. Yeah. Just adding to your habits a little bit, you know? Absolutely, yeah. You got to get in that satanic pizza Friday after all. Yeah, it was every Friday this time. It was every day. (laughs) Every day is Friday. Yeah. (laughs) But it has left her um, a little, a little pale. Mm -hmm. Looks a little weary, a little worse for the wear. Well, in vitamin D. Absolutely. It's very difficult. Now, I know that Leslie makes skincare for a living and everything, and even though it's truly top-notch, even sure soap serums aren't giving her that extra glow she's looking for right now. Sometimes you just need something extra. Just depleted. But fear not. Oh. There is a remedy, and it's easier mm-hmm. to find than you might think. Yeah. Just in your backyard. I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> Are they all in the backyard? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> all you need is a few glittery drops of... Validation. A hill worth dying on. And best of all, Leslie, our fiends can give us this priceless ingredient free of charge. Oh my goodness. And I swear to God, they can't all be in my backyard. But how, Holly? But how, you must be asking yourself. How are they not in our backyard? I don't know. (laughs) Well, I'll tell you how, but I, I can't tell you about the backyard. Okay. Simply head on over to Spotify or Apple Podcasts and leave us a five-star rating and or a friendly review. It really is the only way to move this podcast forward. Ratings and reviews equal attention. Attention equals support. And support equals more and better content for you. 
I like that. Isn't that nice? And I love that it requires, does not require them to be in our backyard. No. Yeah. It does not. But if you just cannot wait for more We Would Be Dead in your life, and who could blame you? Mm -hmm. Don't worry. You don't have to. Oh. You can support us over on Patreon. Patreon. There, for just a few dollars a month, you will gain access to our entire catalog of 30-minute horror movies, special mini-sodes, our weekly after show, Host Mortem, which is available in both video and audio formats. Maybe you want to see our faces. Maybe you don't. Both are okay, but just okay. Like, yeah, you should want to see our faces, but maybe you have to just listen to it because you're busy. Right, yeah. That's acceptable. Mm -hmm. You'll also get a special gift in the mail from us, giveaway opportunities, merch deals, and on-air toast dedicated just to you and more. In all honesty, we are here thanks to our patrons. So come on over and be part of the We Would Be Dead family. That sounds nice. I want to shout someone out soon. Okay. So just like, become a patron. Yeah. Yeah, we're like looking forward to a toast to you. I love it. Yeah. So get in there. And if all of that is just a little bit too much for you, you can simply follow us on social media. We are at Would Be Dead Pod anywhere and everywhere you get your content. You can like our posts, share our posts, Like and share our posts. Mm, That's a good one. It's the best one. You can leave us a comment, post about your favorite episode, let us know when you're listening, tell a friend, tell a neighbor, tell your local sorcerer's apprentice. Oh, what's their name? Carlos. Carlos. All right. He's like an an enigmatic one. Yeah. Like we don't hear much from him. He keeps to himself, Mm -hmm. but he is like secretly magical. Yeah. It's a surprise to everyone when we find out. Absolutely. At least I think so. Mm -hmm. Well, then your friends and Carlos can become fiends and we can all hang out together. I love it. Mm -hmm. But you know he'll get like another name when he becomes the sorcerer. Right. Yeah. What will that name be? We don't know yet. We just can't tell. There's no way to tell. It has to be bestowed upon him. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, if he's the apprentice, I wonder what member of our neighborhood is the sorcerer. Ooh. Yeah, he has to be working under somebody. Right. Come forward. I know. Which one is it? Pam. All right. Well, I mean, you have to throw it in to one of our neighborhood things next week or something. I will. I'll and figure then it it'll out. Come to me. All right. Then you'll just I got yeah. it. Only only one one person. <laughs> <laughs> what a week. One person an episode. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Then your friends, did I already do this part? I don't know. (laughs) Then your friends, Ed Carlos, can become fiends and we can all hang out together. I love it. Yay. (laughs) Sorry, you guys, we've already done all of this, so it's so weird. (laughs) I think that that's all I have in the way of announcements for this week. Great. Leslie, do you have anything to add before you begin? Oh, my gosh. Um, Yes. Okay. I do. So we are still selling our Trevor Project stickers. Yes, 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 yes. So go uh, check out our our Linktree website. There will be a button right there for the Trevor Project um, donation sticker. And uh, there's also, you also see it in our Instagram, like on our grid and yeah. uh, in Facebook as well. So just go in there, click it, get a sticker. Um, they cost $10 and they'll be that money is donated to the Trevor Project. And then we send you out a fun little sticker made by our youngest little fiend. That's right. That's right. The sticker is a gift um, from us for your donation. 100% mm-hmm. of it is going to go to the Trevor Project. So, um, yeah. Get yeah. And there. we are almost at 400 at this get point. Get out. Yeah. You we guys just, are amazing. I know. We had a couple of sales this week. And we have, um, we've had a couple of you send us pictures of your stickers. I love mm-hmm. that. When you get it. Take a picture of your sticker. Take a picture of you with your sticker or where you put it and tag us in it. We'll put up some galleries soon. Um, I love, love, love to see, you know, where they're going in the world and who has them. So that's really fun. Thank you guys for that. And I have a few more that I'm sending out this week. Um, For those who had put in an order um, pretty much like over a week ago and haven't received it, I was hoping to send something else out because of a patron gift that is also going out. Mm -hmm. But there's a little stall at the moment. so. I'm just going to send the stickers ahead and then you'll get something else in the mail later on. You Everybody likes getting mail. Who doesn't? I love it. <laughs> <laughs> that's great, Leslie. Thank you. That was a good addition this week. All right. If that's all we have, then take it away. 
on with the show. Yay! Let's go all the way back to the beginning. I love a beginning. Mark James Kilroy was born on March 5th, 1968 in Chicago, Illinois. His parents were James William Kilroy, who went by Jim, and Helen Josephine Kilroy. Jim was a chemical engineer, and Helen worked as a volunteer paramedic. Ooh, those are smarties. Yes. And helpful people. Very helpful. Just good people. Yeah. All right. All around. Shortly after Mark's birth, the little family moved to a small town outside of Houston in Santa Fe, Texas. Mark's brother, Keith Richard Kilroy, not Keith Richards, but... What if it was? (laughs) I know. That would be crazy. (laughs) Was born in 1970, making him about two years younger. Mark was raised Catholic. He and his family did attend Our Lady of Lourdes Catholic Church frequently throughout his adolescent years. I'm not sure if he continued on during college, but his parents did. Um, They have mentioned that Mark did carry a Bible with him. So even in college, like he might read passages between classes or just have a Bible with him. So that is a serious about their religion person. It might be. Yeah. So I'm not sure if that's true or not, but he could have picked up his religion. As a teenager, Mark was an excellent student and very athletic. He played baseball and basketball on the Santa Fe High School team and enjoyed golf with his friends. He was a Boy Scout, a member of the student council, and an honor student, ranking 14th in a class of 210 students. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Go, Mark. Studious dude, yeah. Upon graduation in 1986, he attended Southwest Texas State University in San Marcos, Texas, before transferring to Tarleton State University in Stephenville, Texas, on a basketball scholarship. Oh, my God. And a serious athlete. Yes. College basketball. Like, that's no joke for sure at tarleton he became a member of the lambada chi alpha fraternity we feel like it's probably lambda why do i keep doing lambada that? is the forbidden dance i know, I, know. <laughs> I, know. <laughs> I want to believe there is a fraternity where they're just sexy dancing all the time wasn't like lambada chi alpha <laughs> i am so bad with chai. those names it's a forbidden Greek. dance and it's tea. <laughs> Probably Lambda Chi, yeah. but you know, whatever. Lambda Chi Alpha <laughs> Fraternity. <laughs> I'm just thinking of them like Magic Mike dancing with yeah. chai tea. Just so like you. Yeah. I want to join that. Can now you like let me in. Now you like it. See? I know. You made it better. Okay. <laughs> <sighs> anyway, he was in a fraternity, folks. He then decided to give up his athletics and transfer to the University of Texas at Austin to become a pre-med student. Wow. He is just yeah. excelling at life. And making big decisions about yes. serious life things. Like, he's no joke. All I right. know. But he had, like, these great parents mm-hmm. who just set him up, just you know? supporting him away. All right. Things are going pretty good for him, I think. Yeah. So that brings us up to the beginning of our story. Quick life right through. Right. Boom. Done. (laughs) Got it. It was now March of 1989 and Mark was 21 years old and prepping for his medical college admission test or the MCAT. Ooh, scary. Spring break was fast approaching and Mark and three of his high school buddies, Bradley Moore, Bill Huddleston and Brent Martin, had planned to reunite and enjoy the much needed spring break by traveling down to the southern tip of coastal Texas to a resort called South Padre Island. South Padre is a barrier island along the Gulf Coast of Mexico. This would be the third time Mark went there on spring break, so they were very familiar with it. It's pretty, too. Mm -hmm. Just a little backstory on South Padre Island, because this is what Hollywood do. Please. I've taught you so well. (laughs) Back in September 1967, Hurricane Beulah caused extensive damage to much of the town. Subsequent to rebuilding from Hurricane Beulah, any multi-story resort, hotels, and condominiums have been erected along the coastline of the Gulf of Mexico, making the island a popular spring break destination for college students and a resort destination for families in the 80s and on. Cool. Very nice. Very nice. So most likely, these guys knew other people going down to the area too. Um, Since they were college students in Texas, I'm sure other people were going to this area as well. Yeah. What was nice about this location was that college students could stay in a hotel on U.S. soil, but walk over 
uh, the border into Mexico enjoy like underage drinking laws and cheap drinks. That is very convenient mm-hmm. if that's what you're looking to do. Yeah. For sure. And I mean, don't do that. No. But it is very convenient. Yeah. On March 10th, 1989, Bradley finished his college exams at Texas AMA University and headed to pick up Mark at his college campus in Austin. The two then drove to Santa Fe to pick up Bill and Brent. The four childhood friends spend the next nine-hour drive discussing their plans for the week, singing along to the radio and gossiping. I don't know. That's just what girls would be doing. (laughs) What do guys do? I hope it's that. I hope it's that, right? I hope they're gossiping viciously, And then we we would have like a thousand snacks. Yes. Activities to do. We'd be Macy like making like friendship bracelets and stuff in the car. There would be playlists. Yeah. Be like, if you're going to get these out. Yeah. If you're going back to the 80s, there were mixtapes. Yes. We'd be very prepared. It'd be so fun. These people. I don't know what they're doing. Do you know if like Jeremy is coming down? <laughs> I hope that's like, what they're doing. <laughs> but they'll be like, is Brenda going to be there? <laughs> <laughs> she said she was. We'll find out. Maybe she maybe yeah. she is. And she's bringing her friend Tracy. I and love oh Tracy. My God. <laughs> she's a dancer. <gasps> oh, Tracy. <laughs> All right. They arrived at their destination just before midnight. I'm not sure what they did at this point. They may have enjoyed the beach at night or walked over to Mexico for any bars or clubs oh that were God. open late. Or they just spent the night in the car because they didn't check into their hotel until the next morning on March 11th. Either way, everything was good at this point. Don't walk over to Mexico at that point. Don't. No, no, no. no. Just go take a nap in your car and then go to your hotel. Yeah. Yeah. They got there. They probably, yeah, like I said, they got there just shortly before midnight. So they probably were like, we're tired. We'll just sleep here. They seem like like pretty responsible college guys. They don't seem like wild, crazy party college guys. No, they they are actually very responsible boys. Over the next two days, the boys spent most of their time at the beach behind their hotel. The boys had gotten there early in the week, so it would be a few days before the area would really fill up with college students. However, there was still a ton going on already. Beer sponsors were staging a variety of events like free concerts, movies, surf simulator activities, opportunities to appear on TV commercials, and even, wait for it, Holly. I'm waiting for it. Free calls home. Oh, that was... That's a big deal back then. I know. That's really nice. Right? What a nice hedonistic resort they were. (laughs) (laughs) It was very nice. And Mark and Bradley both took advantage of that and actually called their parents Of course they did. Of course these kids called their moms. It just warms my heart Mm -hmm. knowing the ending of this story. Mm. On their first full day, March 11th, the boys met a group of female students from Purdue University mm. who they partied with until the next morning. Oh my God, maybe that was Brenda. Maybe. <laughs> she is here. She is here. <laughs> <laughs> On day two, March 12th, the guys went to the beach in the morning and talked about plans to go into Mexico that night. Then lunch, then back to the beach for Miss Tanline concept. Okay. Contest. <laughs> so last time you we talked about Miss Tanlines and I looked it up a lot. Okay, did you? It is one of two things. Okay. Because there are two types of competition they call Miss Tanline. Okay. One is just your standard like Hawaiian tropics, sexy bikini model yes. thing. Which and is what I was picturing. So it's girls in like little tiny bikinis. Mm-hmm. And that is probably what this was. However, it is also a female bodybuilding competition. So they could have been like jacked women on this beach. I don't think that I'm was not- it. <laughs> I don't either, but it's just funny that the if you look this up, like 80s Miss Tanlines competition, it's either young women in next to nothing on a beach mm-hmm. or like bodybuilding women. Right. Who could, who if you tried anything on, would take you right the fuck out. I mean, there's got to be something for everyone, right? I so I was just like, well, how different could you get? All right. So, <laughs> so afterwards... Mark went back to the hotel for a quick nap before their evening outing, which is like so on par. That's what I would do. They took an, I mean, these people, I like them. I know. I would vacation with them. Right. They know what they're doing. That like afternoon nap. Yeah. It's like key. That Both of us do yeah. that. We're like, I'm good. In the beginning of the day, you have brunch, not early breakfast. That's no. for ridiculous people. Yeah. And then around four o'clock though. Well, I need, I need a nap. I got to go lay down. Maybe yeah. have a snack. Then I'm good at night. Yeah. They get it. That night, they left South Padre Island and stopped for dinner at a Sonic Drive-In in in Port Isabel, Texas, where they met a group of female students from the University of Kansas who were also going into Mexico. Right. See, I would have gotten delicious Mexican food, but whatever. (laughs) Well, they were just going there to drink. 
Okay. Fair. It was like late. Like yeah, they get there later, you know. Mm-hmm. And I, it's like a Sonic, Holly. That was. It is exotic. Yeah. They got tots. Oh. Love tots. The women followed Bradley's car from Port Isabel to Brownsville and parked their cars close to the Gateway International Bridge before crossing the U.S.-Mexico border by foot and entering the Mexican town of Matamoros. So Matamoros had a population of over 1 million people. God damn. And was a hot spot of drug trafficking. Oh, so shit. Fun. Oh, my God. <laughs> However, it was still considered a safe place for tourists. <laughs> So many drugs. Yeah. Everything is bad. So safe. Please yeah. go enjoy the yeah. fine establishments it's fine. It's fine. there. They're, they're just, they got some business to attend to. Yes, they're but... very busy. Just ignore them. Yeah. Don't worry. There's they're the Carlos selling... and Charlie's. You're good. They're not selling it to you while you're there. They're bringing it to America. So like while you're there, yeah. you're good. You're not, they don't want you. No. Great. So, <laughs> so the area was packed with festive local bars, nightclubs, and restaurants geared towards people of all ages, especially the youth, since there were like relaxed drinking laws, as we said ah, before. Yes. Mark and his crew in the University of Kansas women spent their mm. evening at Sergeant Pepper's nightclub in Matamoros oh. until about 2.30 a.m. when the bar was closing. The two groups went their separate ways, and Mark and his friends returned to South Padre and passed out hard. They probably made sure all of those girls got home safe, too. Probably. I'm sure. I feel like they did. On March 13th, Mark and his friends attended another Miss Tanline contest behind their hotel. I just want to think it's bodybuilding. Yeah. <laughs> this time. <laughs> they were like, oh, this one's different. Yeah, this time they were the weights. <laughs> <laughs> How I want that to be true. Early in the evening, Mark met with one of his former frat brothers. Um, (laughs) Who was dancing to the genuine song and sipping a nice hot chai. I love it. (laughs) I like the world we've made. I know. (laughs) So, okay. So he met him at like a condo party that this kid was having. At around 10.30 p.m., Mark and his friends headed back to Matamoros. So they had, he was like, I'm going to go hang out with this kid. Then we're going to go to Mexico. And that's what they did. So they. So strikingly similar to mine in like these little ways. Like yes. I knew everybody there as well. Like all the kids are going to the same place. I'm going to see one of my other friends. We're all like, yeah. it's just, mm-hmm. I didn't think they had anything in common, but like the outlines are weirdly yeah. similar. So. Yeah. What was, I'm sorry, what your case last week, what was the name again? Um. Oh, wait. Brittany Drexel. Sorry, yes, I Brittany had like Drexel. a That's right. brain fart for a second. That's okay. Well, so as did I. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but she just, the what she did and how, mm-hmm. I mean. It's just, it's a, spring break. That's yeah. what you do on spring break. She was a little bit less organized. Yeah. She was a little more chaotic in her planning, but like they did the same kind of things. Yes. So, um, and then, so once they were going back to Mexico, they did the same thing where they parked on the border. So they were in Brownsville. Okay. And then they crossed over by foot again. I can't imagine walking into Mexico. I mean, I know for many people, that's nothing to imagine. But that's just wild to me. I know. Yeah. Yeah. We've just never done it. So well, I don't maybe know. we need to go walk into Mexico. All right. Mm-hmm. Let's do it. Mm-hmm. That's all. That night, Matamoros was flooded with 15,000 spring break tourists from the U.S. on the city's main tourist street, Alvaro Obregón. That's the one. The boys remembered it being like a circus, just a lot of energy swarming around. When they got out to uh, Matamoros, Mark and his friends decided to go to the bar with the shortest waiting line, which is 100% what we would have done. Absolutely. You don't want to be standing in a line. That's awful. Nope. They ended up at Los Sombreros. (laughs) The most American Mexican bar I've ever heard of. It's a bar with uh, rock music and bright neon. Need I so fun. say that again? <laughs> After a few drinks, Mark and his friends left Los Sombreros and wandered to the London pub. Which... Also not that Mexican. No. <laughs> but they, uh, which they rebranded it themselves as the Hard Rock Cafe for spring break also time. Also yeah. tracks. Uh, this bar was louder and wilder than Los Sombreros, just a wild London pub. <laughs> <laughs> and Mark and his friends stood at the bar while other tourists threw beer from the balcony. Ew, Such a good time. I don't like that at all. Mark broke off from the group for a period of time when he met some other girls. Around 2 a.m., Bill suggested the group head back to Th- South Padre Island. 
As his friend stepped out of the London pub, they spotted Mark leaning against a car and talking to a woman they recognized from the beach behind the hotel. Brenda. Right? And she may have been from the Miss Handline contest. Then she could really kick some ass. <laughs> the guys caught Mark's attention and he rejoined them to head back to their car. So again, like, this is, this case is so frustrating because everybody is together. Yeah, that's all what, the time. They that's keep exactly what you're supposed to do. They're doing it. <sighs> because all the bars were closing at this time, Thousands of tourists were flooding out of the bars and oh, heading home. I don't like that. Many towards Brownville, just like the guys, but others going in different directions. They tried to stay in a shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder formation to not lose each other. Oh, my God. But they all knew that where they were going, so they just tried to stay as close as they could. Because they even are, like, staying together. I know. They're not, like, even in the crowd. They're like, okay, just make sure everybody's... Mm -hmm. That's what you're supposed to do. Oh, God, so wild. Bradley and Brent were a little ahead of Bill and Mark and the girl uh, he was talking with. So Bradley and Brent reached Garcia's, which is a popular restaurant store close to the border to wait for the rest of the group to catch up. And I actually think the store was um, like red, so it was kind of noticeable too. Okay. Mark had stopped at the steps of a house on the um, Alvaro Ob Obregon Street to say goodbye to the lady that he was talking with. And then... Um, and then he also wanted to wait for, like, Bill to catch up See, a he's bit. walking this girl home. Mm-hmm. Such a gentleman. Bill caught up with him and then was like, ooh, I really got to pee. There's an alley right here. I'm just going to go down to pee. So Mark was like, yeah, yeah, I'll wait for you right here on the steps. When Bill returned, Mark wasn't there. They were separated for one second. Yeah. So he, so Bill looked around for a few minutes. He was just like, did he, where did he go? Did he, like, This is why women don't pee again? alone. Exactly. And then he was like, well, maybe he, maybe he didn't want to wait for me. Maybe he just saw like Brad and Bradley and Brent and like, I'll just walk up there. He peed too. And then he got like arrested for exposure or something. I don't know. So he caught up with Bradley and Brent outside of Garcia's hoping Mark was with them, but he was not. The crew then spent the next two hours looking for their friend. They decided they were like, well, we're not crossing the border till we find Mark. Because they're He's responsible. Here. By 4.30 a.m., all the bars were closed at this yeah. point, and the streets had cleared. Nobody was there anymore. <sighs> they decided to cross the border into Brownsville and head back to their car in case Mark was just waiting for them there. Like, yeah, maybe, maybe he, he got yeah. caught up in the tide or something, mm -hmm. or was... I don't know. Yeah, I would think so, too. I'd be like, well, maybe he just went back and yeah, it's going to be there. Mm -hmm. But he was not there either. Mm -hmm. So they waited for a bit by the car. But ultimately, they felt like they should just head back to the hotel in case Mark was there, possibly having left with the girl he was talking to. Though at this point, the guys were already very concerned because this would not this would have been totally out of character. Like Mark would have told them yeah. if he was just like, I'm going to go hit that. <laughs> like, yeah, you know, like he. Yeah, they he they he wouldn't have just left. He would have waited for Bill to come back, and they would have all just gone. They were if especially if they were all going back to the hotel, he would have been like, "We're all going back. I'll get the girl when so we're going back." So now. again, like the, I, I, what really sticks with me on this one is how responsible for their friends these guys yeah. are. Like we've covered other missing persons cases that are men, and usually those guys, their friends they're with, if they've been out, they're like, "Yeah, he just went home," and they. They just kind of disperse. Yeah. Nobody is like studiously following up. They're like, he'll, he'll hit me up tomorrow. It's fine. No, not these guys. So the next morning on March 14th, the guys woke up in their hotel and Mark was still nowhere to be found. Nor had anyone seen him around the hotel. Ugh. They decided not to wait any longer and went straight to the damn cops to report a missing person. They're so responsible. So they did talk to the police in their area, but they knew ultimately they had to also go to Matamoros. Like yeah. Back into oh, Mexico. that's right, because they have two different countries they have to report mm -hmm. in. Oh. So they went back into uh, Matamoros to talk to the police stations in the area. Maybe Mark had even been taken into one of them. Yeah. But he was not at any of the stations. The police told the three boys not to worry. Their friend probably walked off drunk and possibly on something and will most likely turn up in a day or two with hangover and a blurry memory of what happened to them. Uh, no. Yeah. Not in this case. Sorry. So they, they would tell them that this was typical for spring breakers to do. Mark's three besties, uh, the three Bs, as I like to say. Oh, I like it. 
We're not so sure that this was the case this time, as Good. Holly also believes it's not. The circumstances were too strange, and a little and little did they know at the time, but Mark was one of 60 people who had disappeared at Matamoros in the past three months. 60? 60 people. Six zero? Yeah. Wow. And I assume, so that number does include, like, locals, but also tourists. Doesn't matter. That's I know, so that's many people. Yep. So at this point, the police in South Padre Island and Matamoros both know Mark is missing, and both are quick to assume he's just sleeping off a crazy night. Mark's friends also called his parents to inform them of what's been going on. So, like, immediately they were just like, hey, we're kind of, we kind of hit a wall, but, yeah. like, Mark isn't with us, and you know you know him as well as we do. He, he wouldn't just walk off. And just like I said with Brittany, that's a hard call to make. I know. Calling your friends. Terrified. Well, I mean, it was harder in, in that case because Brittany hadn't told them where yeah. she was going. But still, it's hard to be like, we lost your kid. Yeah. But in both cases, yeah. they, they did, called immediately. They did. The minute yeah. that it was weird to them, they were like, we have to call. Yep. And that and Brittany's boyfriend didn't give a shit that like she lied to her parents. She he absolutely like, did not. Yep. He was just like, you're not going to like this, but. Yep. And she's, like, ghosted me for, like, a half hour. Yeah. So something's off. Yeah, 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 for sure. So now, normally, situations like this one where someone's missing, especially in another country when there's, like, two countries involved as well, and police are quick to judge, can cause the case to get a little swept under the rug. But luckily for the Kilroy family, they knew a guy. Oh, good. Mark's uncle, Ken Kilroy, who worked in the United States Customs Service in Los Angeles. This is just like the, my case, too. Yeah. They knew the Marine. Yes. <laughs> oh, this is so weird. I know. <laughs> I know that is so weird. He used any power that he had to make this case widely known and put pressure on the police in Brownsville because he knew he could pressure the U.S. side. Right. So he was like, this is what I can do. And they can get in contact with, like, yeah. the city next door, which is Matamoros. Yeah, there's not much uh, non-citizens can really do mm -hmm. with the Mexican police, I assume. Right. And then Brownsville is the spot where they would park their car to go over. Okay. Um. So they scrambled to put together, the Brownsville Police Department scrambled to put together a police task force to search for Kilroy. At first, the Brownsville Police Force was just like, you have a missing a U.S. citizen in your arrow, like Matamoros. So, like, you need to deal with this. And then the Matamoros was just like, uh, nah, dude, you have a missing person in your city and you have to deal with it. So it was just Mexico versus the U.S. Yeah. <laughs> Not good. It probably wouldn't go over the same way now, but back then, absolutely. Yeah. But luckily, because of what Ken was doing to get this case out there, mm -hmm. the more people were finding, you know, like all of Texas at this point knew that like Mark was missing. Yeah. And um, so they ain't quiet in Texas. Right. And so the city was finding out like, hey, this doesn't look good for us because, you know, the tourists are coming yeah, down right now. Yeah, they are right a now. city of tourism. So that's yeah. probably a lot of United States tourism too. So exactly. So they didn't want anything, any negative like outcome of this right. to be there. Right. So really their only game was to try to blame Brownsville, but either way they were going to have to do something mm -hmm. about it. So the three Bs, Bradley, Brent, and Bill, mm -hmm. <laughs> pushed hard to invalidate like any claim by the Matamoros like police department saying like he didn't get lost here. And they were like, no, he did. Like yeah, he absolutely did. Um, there was no way Mark made it over the border that night. So within 48 hours, Mexican Federal Police Force agreed to work on the case and help U.S. investigators. They, too, were worried about the negative impact that this high-profile case could have on the area. They assigned a few Mexican, uh, few Mexican agents to the Texan officials to accompany them in Matamoros, and this was very helpful in questioning several informants that were especially like local informants yeah. and potential witnesses. Together, they worked on all the tips provided by their sources. So, okay. yes. The uh, Texan officials contacted the U.S. consulate in Matamoros and asked investigators to carry out a search with Mark's description in Matamoros jails, hospitals, and morgues. They also did this in and around the area of South Padre Island as well, just in case. Okay. Over the next three days, they searched for Mark this way but had no luck. Meanwhile, the three Bs were brought back over to Matamoros to retrace their steps that night. Investigators thought it might be good to bring in a hypnotist to help uncover any more details from that night. I know. Okay. It's tough, but in this case, 
it kind of helped. I mean, hypnosis is a thing. I, I get it. I give it credence. Mm-hmm. But like, there's just so many problems with that kind of thing. And like, the spotty memories and any kind of power of suggestion will yeah. guide you to other things. But if it worked, that's great. What I kind of like, though, is that they almost did it immediately in a right. sense of like, like, this just happened. Let's see if we can really open up your mind to really visualize your surroundings. Yeah. Yeah. So now in some reportings of this case, they say Bradley went under. However, in a New York Times article, they interviewed Bill Huddleston, who said that he was the one who went under hypnosis, which would make more sense to me because he was technically the last one to see Mark that night. So I'm going to say that it was Bill who was put under. Right. That's that's the most valuable of the memories. I gotcha. Now, under hypnosis, Bill stated that he saw a young Hispanic man wearing a blue plaid shirt and um, had a visible scar across his face, talking to Mark before he disappeared. Oh. He recalled that the man walked up to Mark and asked, Hey, don't I know you from somewhere? Though Bill said that he was not sure if Mark responded. And though Bill wasn't super confident when this took place, he did believe that it was probably while he was walking back from like when he peed in the alleyway. Okay. This uncovered memory led investigators to believe that Mark was possibly kidnapped for robbery or ransom. Mm. The first option seemed the most likely because the abductors had not called for a payment yet. So they were like, it's clearly not a ransom one because they would have been like in contact at this point. Yeah. Especially with like news media attention Mm -hmm. and stuff. And thus the likelihood that Mark was alive was slim. Mm -hmm. They speculated that his body was probably dumped in a remote location. So now they're, they have helicopters and terrain vehicles um, that were used uh, through the United States Border Patrol um, to look through the Rio Grande River. Uh, but his body was not found, though others were. <laughs> so Others were? Yes. <laughs> oh, no. Like, well, I mean, these bodies aren't the ones we're looking for. So just but, toss them back. Yeah. <laughs> they probably wanted to be there. It's okay. Yeah. I feel like they solved a lot of other cases <laughs> yep, maybe. Like, during this case. Oh, God. So Mark's parents, Helen and Jim, headed down to Brownsville, Texas, to help with the investigation. They worked on passing out a missing persons poster of Mark to all the spring breakers. 20,000 posters were circulated throughout the region. Helen would stand by the border bridge, handing out posters to anyone who walked by. Oh, Helen. There was a $10,000 reward for anyone who could help locate their son. And according to Jim, um, in a book that he co-wrote, which I will put a link to, he talks about his process being this process of like figuring out the um, the reward money to be like really hard because if it was too high, it not only would they receive like a boatload of crap calls, but there could also be a rise in kidnapping of American students in hope of also getting the same reward. Oh, no, that's so hard. I know. I like sometimes I forget about that thought that they're just like, oh, I can make some money. I'll make money off of it. Oh, God. So people. Yeah. So people from Mark's hometown also traveled down to the area to help hand out posters and help search for uh, help search where they could. State officials were also doing what they could to assist the Kilroys on the case. The Kilroys and Texas investigators were trying to work as fast as they could to get Mark's face out to everyone in the area and question as many people as they could. Because this was a spring break town, which meant anyone who may have seen Mark and could give them some sort of lead would be leaving soon. Oh, that's hard. Mm -hmm. So each week that went by without any solid information was another week further away from them ever finding out the truth. God, I can't even imagine. Mm -hmm. That's terrible. Now, after several weeks, because now it's been several weeks and they have Uh. not gotten anywhere. Both Mexican and U.S. authorities continued to suspect that Mark's disappearance involved foul play. They speculated that Mark could have been a victim of drug-related violence or of a robbery killing. Maybe he saw something he wasn't supposed to. Maybe. Possibly even a victim of police brutality that's being covered up. Ooh. The U.S. investigators were cool with the Mexican uh, federales, but had some thoughts about the local Mexican police um, because they were known to... Like, they were known to kind of bully the American tourists into, like, giving them money. So they would, like... The police. Great. Yeah. Great, mm-hmm. great, 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 great. So, yeah, if they were, like, peeing on the street, they would, like, 
go after them. Or, I told or you, not you don't even pee that. outside. I know, but not even that. But like they could just be like walking and just be like, hey, like, what are you doing? And like kind of scare them into like giving them money. And then if they didn't, sometimes it could turn kind of shady and I hate it. I know. I don't love it. So and that's not all the police down there, probably. But um, yeah. and not anymore. Yeah, most likely. This was this was a while ago. Yeah. So, in a Washington Post article from November 1989 titled Voodoo, Drugs, and Murder by Jake Anderson, he reports, quote, U.S. agents used the Kilroy case to praise the Mexican federal judicial police for their extensive efforts in exposing the drug cult. But those U.S. agents couldn't say the same for Mexican officials at the state and local level. A paucity of information and a lazy approach to the case by local police led many on the U.S. side of the investigation to suspect that the drug ring had insiders in the Mexican police. Mm, I don't like that at yeah. all. So, the I mean, here's the hard thing, because you have to think about the, like, average income there, which I think I'm about to mention. Okay. But it's pretty low. It's, it's around 2 to $3. So I don't know how much these police were making. They might have been making a little bit more, but it's still like low income down there. Mm. So if they are like the drug stuff was kind of how they were making revenue or, you know, doing these backdoor deals and things like that. I mean, we see we see it now like corrupt cops now. Like, but that's that was just the case for them. It was almost like they kind of had to do it because it was the way they could feed their families. God. So. With still no leads, fundraisers in Brownsville were able to raise the reward money up to 15000 hoping that that would help. The daily wage in Matamoros at the time was averaging around 2 to $3, which means that this money could cover a family for the year or a single person for several years. Wow. Unfortunately, though, this brought in no new solid leads, and any, new, any leads that they had initially uh, were starting to become dead ends. On March 26th, America's Most Wanted did a 10-minute segment on Mark's case that was broadcasted to both the U.S. and Mexico. During filming, the three Bs were asked by the producer to react to reenact their night once again, but this time at the same time it occurred so they could get a really good picture of what the town of Matamoros is like at such a late hour. This, make, this segment gave the case a nationwide attention and generated 2,000 phone calls and letters with people giving clues as to Mark's whereabouts. That's the downfall of, like, including the public at large. Yes. Yeah. You get, like, a quadrillion leads that are all false. Yeah. So one of the calls came from a Mexican woman who told the police that she was dating a Mexican police officer, like, in Matamoros. Okay. And that he might be the killer. Um, okay. He, he had confessed to her that he was harassing an American tourist and ended up killing him and dumping his body. Oh, God. The, I'm afraid where this is going. Yeah. Because you're not going to be done this quick. It's not him. <laughs> the police followed up on this as they knew that the local Mexican police were corrupt. They brought in the officer, but ultimately ultimately uncovered that he was not involved in Mark's case. But clearly somebody well, who's <laughs> Whose case? I was know. it a case? I think they did. Oh, God. <laughs> figure something out. That was the fear, is that it was yeah. like, yeah, he sure did kill somebody. It just wasn't yeah. Mark. Yeah. <laughs> oh. So other people called saying that Mark, um, that they had Mark and they would meet up to receive the ransom. Yeah, same. But police were able to rule out these people by using pieces of the case that only they had known. Clever. Mm-hmm. And as with any case in the 80s, rumors of Mark's case in connection with occult rituals and sacrifices started creeping in. Uh, yeah, they loved satanic the panic. Mm-hmm. And Madame Moros definitely had some history with the occult, but the U.S. police weren't sure if they even wanted to go down this route because they were dealing with it in America. And they were like, oh, I don't know, guys. It's <laughs> never really what you think it is. This is not a safe bet. Yeah, <laughs> it's normally just pedophiles. <laughs> oh, yeah, a lot of times it is. <laughs> and he's 21. So, oh, God. I don't know. Yeah, that's, let's not do that. So they felt really unsure about it until, that is, they received a letter, which um, authorities may have, so authorities may have received an anonymous letter that was scribbled with pentagrams and sinister drawings of and a did. single sentence in Spanish reading, Mark was not the first. Well, that's cryptic. Yeah. Now, I have tried to find other places that this letter is like documented as 
them receiving. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure if that's true. Okay. It might be. But yep. It's still fun to put in there. Yeah. Okay. So at this point, Mark's mother, Helen, had already headed back home to Santa Fe where she would wait by her phone in case her son tried to call. She unfortunately was also subjected to several calls from men claiming to have kidnapped her son and wanted to collect the award money for his safe return. But um, she also was able to rule out a lot of these as fake. Um, But she would try to meet up with a few of them with like, uh, she would always have backup. um, But, you know, I'm only 50 minutes in and we're not close yet. (laughs) So none of these people panned out. Meanwhile, Jim had stayed in the area of Brownsville, working close with authorities on both sides and making strong connections with them. After several weeks, though, he decided to go back home as well to be with his family and continue to spread the word about Mark, knowing that investigators were doing all that they could. I think they even pulled out um, their younger son, Keith, from school just so they could all, like, be together. Mm. I'm sure that, like, I wouldn't be able to stay in school. No, I'm sure that poor kid was, like, yeah. Couldn't concentrate on anything. Then on April 1st, 1989, there was a break in the case. Ooh. Yes. The Federales had a checkpoint set up uh, to check vehicles for drugs. So as I had mentioned before, Madame Morris was a drug trafficking hotspot. And though the local police didn't care much about it because it brought in revenue, the Federales did. Okay. And I believe at this time, the U.S. and Mexico were working together to crack down on drugs so that the checkpoints were fairly were were fairly often and they were usually looking for like big transports. Yeah. So during this checkpoint on April 1st, a red pickup truck ran through a roadblock without stopping. It crossed the international border from Texas and sped through the Mexican Federal Highway 2, which connects Matamoros and Reynosa, Tamaulipas. Mm. One, and I apologize to anyone that speaks Spanish uh, for any of my pronunciations this week. The one I'm, language I can kind yeah. of speak. <laughs> I truly apologize. The one other language I can speak English. Yes, she can. You do pretty good with English. I'm actually. all right. I talk okay sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> So one of the officers thought that they recognized the pickup truck driver as Elio Hernandez Rivera, a 22-year-old Matamoros local that frequented the bars and was also a known drug dealer. Okay. So instead of flashing their lights on, the police decided to follow it using an unmarked vehicle. They followed the truck to a large cattle ranch called Santa Elena, which was just outside, just outside Matamoros, Texas. The police kept their distance as the truck came to a stop. And then after about 30 minutes, the driver left the ranch and headed back toward the city. In some reportings, they say that this is where a lot, this is where I read a lot of different (laughs) versions. I'm sure. In some reportings, the driver just, they were just like seeing, they got to this ranch and they were like, what's here? And they just kind of let the driver go because they like knew who they like realized who the driver was and like we can get them later if there's like something weird happening. Okay. Um, even though he like ran through this yeah, checkpoint. Come on, like man. He, <laughs> um in other reports, like they had arrested him already at this point. Oh. But um either way, it'll all it'll all get connected. Okay. It's okay. coming around. I hear it. Instead of keeping tabs on the driver, so I'm gonna go on this route, right? All right. Okay. We're choosing our own adventure and we choose to <laughs> not keep tabs on the driver. Got it. The undercover officers decided that now would be a good time to check out the ranch. They were like, what's here? <laughs> this is nice. Oh, well, we're already here. Yeah. So. Mm-hmm. <laughs> On the drive-in, they noticed that they noticed pens and livestock, uh, a barn, and some shacks. Were they pigs? Yeah. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> and there was an awful lot of pricey-looking cars, right? And pigs. That, and pigs. All of this is, I don't know, guys. <laughs> As they approached, they were greeted by Domingo, the ranch's caretaker. Oh! The undercover officer driving claimed to be lost and looking for directions. I'm so lost! Oh my goodness. As one of the officers talked to Domingo, the other officer got out of the car and walked around the ranch. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> Which, like, I actually have been with people that would be like, what's going on over here? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's not totally out of character <laughs> yeah. for everyone. They'd be like, I'm just going to take a walk. Yeah. I need to stretch my legs. On this other person's property in this other country. Yeah. And they probably have a lot of guns. Fine. Yeah. <laughs> the officer who got out of the car walked over to an empty blue Chevrolet Suburban SUV. Inside was a car phone, which back in 1989 oh, was yeah. quite the luxury item. You were very wealthy if you had a car phone back then. There were also traces of marijuana as well as a cement statue with an evil pointing looking head made of seashells. <laughs> <laughs> okay, evil is up to interpretation. How do we I know? <laughs> I know. I, I wish I could find a photo of this. I really do too because yeah. it has to pretty much say like evil on it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. It just says. El Diablo. Yeah. <laughs> the right. officer recognized it as a deity, but was not sure which one it was. Okay. Meanwhile, the officer talking to Domingo started to sense the caretaker was getting a little nervous, so he called the other officer back and they left. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like this, cops. We should leave. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it was clear that the Hernandez family, like, since they were pretty sure that that was Elio in the car. Right, right, right. They were, they were clear that the Hernandez fa family were definitely still dealing drugs. Like, they were like, nobody has this many nice-looking cars on this, like, ranch. Guys, like, I think they're de dealing demon drugs. They're de bad. Yeah. But weren't sure to what extent their operation was like. The property was put under surveillance, and police talked to local informants about the family and the activities going on at Santa Elena. This is, seems kind of low-key for that, but okay. I guess you well, have to proceed with caution. But also, they, at this point, are literally just like, are we breaking, like, some drug dealers up? That's all they're thinking oh right God. now. Oh, Lord. Okay. The police would learn that the Hernandez drug cartel was growing and some weird shit was happening at the ranch. Yeah, you think? There had also been some rival gang members that had mysteriously gone missing over the past several months, and many suspected that they went missing at Santa Elena Ranch. Maybe they were some of the 60. Mm. Marijuana also seemed to be the primary drug being produced and sold over the Mexican border into Texas. I don't know. That feels kind of low-key, but whatever. Yeah. Well, that's what I mean. It was like kind of low-key. They mm -hmm. weren't. And really, the only reason they went over there is because this one douchebag drove through a checkpoint. So, local police soon after arrested Elio for running through a checkpoint and for being in possession of marijuana. Yeah. And so for, finally. like, probably a lot of other weird shit, but okay. Yeah, but at this point, yeah. this is what he did. All right, fair enough. <laughs> so, under questioning, Hernandez Rivera identified several drug dealers and revealed that his family owned a small ranch in the, in the part hinterlands about 20 miles west of Matamoros. Um, so on Sunday, April 9th, police stormed Santa Elena Ranch and found 64 pounds of marijuana, which is... Okay, that's enough. It's enough. And um, so I had to visualize this, right, because I'm really bad with, like, weights and shit. So 64 pounds is 1,024 ounces. And ounces is like a Ziploc, a sandwich Ziploc size of weed. That's so when you get an ounce, they call it a zip, I think. I think. I don't know. <laughs> I'm a mom now. So. <laughs> I don't know what I these weed know. people do. That's but weird. Like a sandwich bag. <laughs> a oh. peanut butter size sandwich. Oh, my God. <laughs> so there are 100 or 1,024 That's a sandwich lot. bags That's... of weed they found just like sitting there. There's like these are all on a table. <sighs> That's um, weed. It is. It is. But it's not a crazy amount to me. Like when I'm thinking of a huge drug cartel operation. It's not a crazy <laughs> amount to me. No. I think they call it a, a, a Ziploc bag of weed, I think is what they call it. <laughs> a zip, honey. <laughs> I don't know these things. <laughs> they also found several firearms and a few and a few hard working drug smugglers. They probably were hard work. They were. Of course they That's were. That's tough. Yeah. So Serafin Hernandez Garcia who was the cousin or nephew of Elio. Could go either <laughs> way. Could go, <laughs> again, the reportings and also Seraphin and Elio are like, they get switched all the time. Like sometimes it's Elio that they arrested. Sometimes it's Seraphin that they arrested. Right. It's, it's all over the place. I, I, does it not matter? I don't know, but I'm just going to let, I'm going to let everybody know it. All of this coming out might be because of Ser Seraphin. Okay. So I just want to give him his due in case, he was owed it. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So David Serna uh, Valdez and Sergio Martinez Salinas 
were also placed under arrest for drug trafficking. While in custody, the detainees were very relaxed and were not giving up any useful information. We were just like, this is nice. Very relaxed. How are you relaxed in that? I mean, you had to have been there before to be relaxed. They were just, they weren't worried. It was all that weed. Yeah, they were just like, yeah, man. We're so high, it doesn't matter. So meanwhile, investigators back at the ranch wanted to talk to Domingo Reyes Bustamante. The, that was the ranch's caretaker, mm-hmm. good old Domingo. This time, Domingo wasn't shy to talk. All he right. told police that the Hernandez family had frequent visitors to the ranch. And for no other reason than because it was a routine procedure, the investigator showed Domingo a picture of Mark and asked if he'd ever seen him. He was just like, you know what, why we're here? Have you, like, seen this guy? Oh, no. This feels like, okay. And to their surprise... He had. Oh, no. Domingo remembers just a few weeks prior a tall, blonde, young, white male that was there, and they had taken him over to the shack. And he pointed to the shack. Ew, just like the shack is not a good way. I don't like anything called the shack. I know. So Domingo remembers that this visitor was different from the others as he didn't speak Spanish at all. He, like, couldn't understand him. But So he was like, so he was probably American? He then told officers that Mark was placed in one of the vehicles overnight. (gasps) Overnight? Which he felt bad about, so he brought him some food and water to feed him. Now... Oh, this guy, like, saw him. Okay. But then his bosses took him away the next morning, and that was the last he saw of him. Oh, no. Well, geez, thanks, Domingo. That was very helpful. That was extremely helpful, sir. This piece of information was given to the investigators who were back at the police station where they interrogated all the arrestees separately. But Elio, still sporting a calm demeanor, confessed that several people, including Mark, had been killed over the course of several months as Santa Elena. Just chill about it? He was just like, oh, okay, yeah, so well, that guy have some of that information. So like, yeah, we did kill him. There were other, but there were others. Like, why do you care about Mark? <sighs> So, Elio explained that the victims had been ritually slain in the belief that human sacrifices would make the gang invincible and protect their drug business from the police. Well, that would make you low-key with the police. Mm -hmm. Two of the cultists were rumored to have been wearing necklaces made from human vertebrae when they were arrested. And they said that their rights made them invisible and impervious to bullets. Yeah, they seem real invisible right now. Right? But, like, this is why they're so chill. Because they're just like, nothing bad is going to happen. Like, yeah, like, we are here. They're asking us questions. But, like, we're protected. I I am, under normal circumstances, pretty opposed to referring to the killers in our cases stupid or anything like that. Because a lot of times they are not stupid. And, well, they're brainwashed at this point. However, being like, Yes, police. This made me invisible to the police. Clearly, I am invisible. (laughs) That's No, you're not. I'm sorry. At this point, you can't use that one. You got to put that in your pocket and not say it because they're police. Not you. Okay. Sorry. Continue. When asked who had murdered Mark, he and others all answered El Padrino, the godfather. Obviously. Right? Based on their testimony, warrants were issued for the arrest of five more members of this cult, including Aldafo de Jesus Costanzo, the 26-year-old mastermind and religious leader of the group. Well, yeah, get that guy. Yeah, he's he's important. Yeah. And Sarah Aldrett, a 24-year-old student at Texas Southmost College in Brownsville. Oh, she's in the cult? She's in the cult. Oh, shit. She's not just in the cult, Holly. She is known as Costanzo's godmother or the witch. She is like his second. Oh, so she's a, she's a big deal in the cult. Yeah. <gasps> Just a low-key American college student, mm-hmm, also mm-hmm, a cult member mm-hmm. and cult leader, I guess. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. On Tuesday, April 11th, investigators from Mexico and, and the U.S. went back to Santa Elena. They took Elio with them, who was still acting pretty relaxed. He was like, eh, everything's fine. But his calmness really pissed off the Mexican officers who yeah. continued to beat the relaxed look right out of him. They, like, could not handle it. I, I, I don't approve that normally, I but, know. like, yeah. Well, what I find is really funny, because, again, this is, like, the end of the 80s, and they're working with, it's U.S. police and Mexican police. Mm-hmm. So the U.S. police are, like, trying to do their, like, 
their investigation one way, mm -hmm. but they're also working with completely different rules and laws. Oh, Lord. So it's just like the Mexicans are just like <laughs> beating the shit out of these people because they You're can. are on our territory now, man. Yeah, we're allowed to like beat them into submission. I don't know. I kind of want to beat these guys into <laughs> submission know. anyway, so... <laughs> Um, and I don't Carry know. I Mexico. don't even know if that's necessarily true. But these guys were fine with it. <laughs> <laughs> so investigators approached the wood shack where Domingo had said he saw them take Mark. Listen, the shack never good news. Yeah, the Mexican officers decided to stay outside the shack that clearly smelled like death. The closer they got, they were smart. Yeah, fearing that fearing the black magic held within the shack's walls. Can't believe satanic panic wins in this case. <laughs> Um, so the U.S. officials weren't so superstitious, though, um, but they okay. begrudgingly entered without them. Elio was taken into the shack with them. They were like, well, he's coming with us. Yeah, we're going in. You're coming. Yeah. They found two lit candles on the floor, which meant someone had been there recently. Perhaps Adolfo. Uh, Adolfo. Sorry, I should want to say Maybe. not Adolfo. <laughs> <laughs> it was Adele. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> Adolfo, yeah, yeah. who they were actively searching for at this point. Near the two lit candles, there were four kettles contained that contained a dead rooster, a goat's head, a turtle, coins, twigs, and an Alegua, Alegua statue. Okay. Just like the statue that they had uncovered in that, um, that... How do you spell that? Now I want to see what it looks like. Alegua. It's a e l e g u a. Hold on. I'm going to look it up. I want to see it. But yeah, so this is the statue that reminded them of the one they saw in the blue Chevrolet Suburban over like with the shells and stuff. But they could be decorated any which way. Uh, okay. I mean, yeah, it's kind of sinister looking. Mm -hmm. It's not, I don't know that you could like immediately say that's evil. I mean, in 1980, whatever, you, you definitely mm -hmm. could, but it's just it has like a tribal quality to it okay. a lot of them are made with like little cowrie shells mm -hmm. they're like deadpool colors <laughs> like yeah, it's, yeah yeah okay all right depending on how they did it mm -hmm. so alegua they discovered is in or orisha o r i s h a mm -hmm. a deity of roads in the religion of santeria as i was going to say this sounds mm -hmm. like santeria as well as several other religions. So it seems that the deity they are sacrificing to is one that protects them on the road while they smuggle drugs. Makes sense. That tracks, yeah. The floor was littered with te tequila bottles, coins, half-smoked cigars, and chili peppers. At least they were also having fun. Dried blood was splattered everywhere. Uh, bleh. Two bloody wires hung from a beam above, which Elio explained was used to hold people by the wrists as they were drained from blood. Okay. An iron cauldron sat in the center of the room. Yep, there it is. Later identified as the Naganga. Yeah, you can you can buy them at all these shops mm. sometimes. I wouldn't, but you can. A Naganga plays a key role in the Palo religion. Palo is a, or Palo? Palo. I don't know. Palo, Palo. Just P-A-L-O. Mm -hmm. I would say Palo, like yeah. Palo Santo. Yeah. yeah. Palo is an African diasporic religion that developed in Cuba during the late 19th or early 20th century. It arose through a process of syncretism between the traditional Congo religion of Central Africa, the Roman Catholic branch of Christianity, and spiritism. And syncretism is when you merge several discrete theologies and myths together to give a sense of unity and a more accepting religious philosophy, but it can also just be a way for a dangerous person to merge parts of various religions that they specifically like to get what they want. Oh, so you're just cherry-picking your cult. All yeah. right. Which is kind of how a lot of side religions happen. It is, you know? for sure. I can name a good amount of them. I won't, but yeah, there yeah. are a lot that are like, you know what, I just don't really like the hell thing, so let's yeah. start mm -hmm. this. We'll take this part out, and we're going to bring this part over here, mm -hmm. and then, yes. So the naganga, which was the iron cauldron, is not just a vessel for the sacrifice, but it is also believed to be the inhabitant, to be inhabited by the spirit they are worshiping. So it's almost just like that is the spirit. Yeah, they catch it in the thing. Yeah. Don't they, they always have like nails and stuff yeah, in them. It's like when and... you catch a leprechaun. <laughs> no. Um, so it's super important in these rituals. 
It is deemed either male or female. Theirs was a male. Okay. The Naganga is the source of all its worshippers' supernatural powers, so it matters what they put into it. Key ingredients are sticks, term, termed palos, uh, believed to embody the properties and powers of the trees from which they came. Soil from various locations is also added, for instance, from a graveyard, hospital, prison, and a market, um, as may water from various sources, including a river, well, and the sea. Okay. Other material uh, added can include animal remains like feathers, shells, plants, gemstones, coins, razor blades, knives, padlocks, horseshoes, railway, railway spikes, blood, Wax, certain types of liquor, wine, quicksilver, and spices. Really, just anything can go in there. Yeah, yeah. You make it your own. Mm -hmm. um, objects that are precious to the owner or which have been obtained from far away may be added. And the harder that these objects are to obtain, the more significant they are often regarded. Obviously. The better kept the vessel is, the more powerful it can become. And the more powerful it is, the more protection it gives. So, this particular naganga was filled with what was described as soup made from sticks, a goat's head, chicken feet, bones, a turtle, herbs, horseshoes, coins, blood, strands of hair, and what looked like human remains. Uh. Elio said that those remains were most likely Mark's brains. <gasps> oh, God. The Mexican investigators forced Elio to drag the cauldron outside. So this is like what's frustrating to the Americans because they were like, can you guys not touch anything? Just leave it. <laughs> can please just, just leave, leave it. it. <laughs> but they forced Elio to drag the cauldron outside where they immediately performed their own ritual to drive away the evil spirits. And then they fired their machine guns into the air before storming into the, sh the shack and dousing everything in holy water. Okay, I wouldn't. Wouldn't be my first choice of how to process that crime scene. <laughs> However, Americans are also not on their territory, and these guys might have seen some shit before. Yeah. Well, this is a very um, superstitious I area. also already had a plan for us. They were like, oh, Nganga, that's yeah. what this is. Yeah. Get out your guns in holy water. Yeah. I think if I were the American cops, I'd be like, by all means. I know. <laughs> so, again, that bit that I just told you about them dousing and yeah, all that yeah. stuff. I only heard it in like two Okay, so portions. maybe they did. Maybe they maybe didn't. They didn't. But they will do something later and so it could have just been like split yeah, this, yeah. this portion. Again, guys, I really tried to get the actual facts. Okay. <laughs> the the more well-known an old, especially an older case is mm -hmm. the more varied information you're going to get on it. Yeah. There's going to be a thousand different retellings of it and they're all going to have their own eccentricities. It yes. can be very hard to sort them out. I get mm -hmm. it. So if this is what happened, right. the American investigators were <laughs> like, oh my dear God, the crime scene, the evidence. So in our choose your own adventure, <laughs> they, they doused, doused the thing in holy water <laughs> and shot their machine guns into the air. Yes. Continue. <laughs> But the Mexican investigators thought cleansing the area of evil was way more important. So um, there were also no photographs that had been taken beforehand. Right, so they legit just like tampered with the evidence. <sighs> luckily, that does not cause much trouble in the end. The anyway. American police officers, if that is the case, were probably like, <laughs> <laughs> just head explosions all but over the place. But we just found out about DNA. Like, really? I mean, we're like, saving oh shit God. now. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. But the police then asked Elio where Mark was buried. They were like, all right, where's this kid? Were they like, in the kettle? <laughs> Sorry. So he pointed to one of the livestock pens and said that he was over there in a corner. Protruding two to three feet out of the dirt was a wire that Elio said was attached to Mark's spinal cord. Oh. So that once his body had decomposed, they could pull it out and wear it as a necklace. Okay. Yes, this gets really rough, guys. Um, this was rougher than like I thought that this case was going to be because again, I thought that, like this really wasn't a satanic panic. No, I remember episode. it's very blood and gutsy. Yeah. So Elio was told to dig up Mark's body. He wasn't sure why the police cared so much about Mark specifically when there were other bodies buried all around them. The police would get to them later. Well, also, and there like, were just like if you can prove this one specific person that gives yeah. you way more of grounds to stand on. To be exactly, like, yeah. Mark's mouth 
So they dug him up. Mark's mouth had been taped shut and his brain was scooped out. His legs were severed at the knees, but Elio explained that this was only to make the burial easier. So that's postmortem, thank God. Yeah. Elio and the others who were arrested were made to dig up all the other bodies. They are probably stunned. Yeah. They're like, why do I have to? I'm invisible. Yeah, you can't. See I me. can't dig. Yeah. They uncovered a total of 15 mutilated male bodies, including <gasps> Mark's. Some of the victims had been slashed with knives, others shot. At least one had been burned, another hanged. Many had been savagely disfigured, their hearts ripped out, their ears, eyes, and testicles removed. One had been decapitated. Good God. Mark's corpse was officially identified after the Brownsville police matched his dental records with the teeth found at the scene. Investigators concluded that most of the victims were rival drug dealers of Costanzo's and uh, not random abductees like Mark. Three out of the 15 bodies were never identified. There was no sign of cannibalism that happened during that. Um, at Santa Elena, the Mexican police continued searching and were able to seize another 100 and, or sorry, 243 pounds of marijuana, 108 grams of cocaine, 12 firearms, including three submachine guns, uh -huh. and 11 vehicles, some equipped with the car phones. All right. So let's go. I'm going to do like a little wiki rundown of what has happened to Mark the night he disappeared. So okay. we'll go through the events. According to Elio, he said that Adolfo had ordered his men to find a white Anglo male in Spanish. He probably said gringo to sacrifice. He apparently uh, earlier that week had tried sacrificing someone else who gave little indication that they were in pain before they died. So they were just like, he was trying to torture him, and he was just, like, holding in the pain. Jeez. Adolfo, who was worried that the lack of pain or agony exhibited by the sacrifice would not be enough to appease the Naganga, gave uh. his followers the task of finding another male. This time, someone with a good brain, someone smart. Get one of those students. Oh. So, Elio and a few others followed, um, and a few other of the followers, had mingled with the spring break students in Matamoros on the night of March 14th. As Mark stood on the street near his friends, one of the men lured him to his truck, just like the guy saw in his mm. um, hyp hypnosis. <gasps> when Mark approached the vehicle, Elio and, Elio and or Seraphin and another cult member, Malio Fabio Ponce Torres, grabbed Mark and wrestled him inside the truck. At this point, Bill Huddleston was peeing in the alley and the girl Mark was talking to probably had already walked away. She went in her house, right? Because he walked her to her door. Or just like, I think they just like went up somewhere. on like a, a doorstep. Okay. Like just to like get out of the way of everybody walking oh, by. Oh, okay. Okay. That makes sense. Because they thought it was the girl from the Miss Tan line contest. Right. It also very well could have been Sarah. Like it could have been another girl because she wasn't that much older than them at this yeah. point. She was only 24. So I don't know. Yeah. Um, and she was American. So it's like. She's out there fishing. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So Mark is now, he's like aggressively been taken into the car. One of the gangsters, or this is the bricky one down and they called it a gangster. Of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Stopped for a few moments to catch his breath. I don't understand this part. Like to catch his breath, like he was driving. So they just stopped for a maybe, moment. <laughs> maybe driving takes it out of him. Maybe it does. You don't know. I that guy it. might have been I like, it. <gasps> but either way, they made like a, a little stop and Mark decided to take this as an opportunity and he broke loose and ran. All right, Mark. But was intercepted by another vehicle driven by another group of Adolfo's followers. So like they were coming and that's probably why they stopped. Maybe somebody else was coming to pick him up. Maybe. Um, and they held him at gunpoint to get him back in to the car. Mm. So they subdued him and, and handcuffed him um, back into the second car. Then the gang drove Mark through the back streets of the city and past an industrial area, passing through the city's outskirts to Santa Elena Ranch. The men left Mark inside the car overnight. Just like the guy said. Mm -hmm. Shortly after dawn, the rancher, the ranch caretaker, Domingo, went to see Mark and fed him bread, eggs, and water. Okay, so his story tracks. Got it. About 12 hours after Mark was kidnapped, Adolfo and his men came to see him. They wrapped his face and mouth with duct tape and walked him through a field to a storage cabin 
with his hands still tied around his back. Mm. Throughout the night of the 15th, Adolfo tortured him mercilessly. And some sources say that he, like Adolfo, even sodomized him. Uh. Although I'm hesitant. I mean, I'm not so sure because I could believe that he did this. Of course. You can believe anything at this point. I could not find the official, and maybe it's out there. I, I'm not as great as, like, searching for these things. But I couldn't find, like, the um, the autopsy report of this. I so, don't. I, judging by how the condition his body yeah, seems I don't to be know in, that they I don't could. know that you could have even have told. Yes. So I'm only a little hesitant to believe that he was sodomized only because Mark is considered a sacrifice and right. he was and Adolfo cared so much about what the Naganga was going to like think and feel from mm-hmm. his sacrifice that if he ruined his sacrifice by doing anything to it, anything sacrilegious to it. Sodomy he, doesn't mean that he was having sex with this guy. He could have put anything in any orifice. Sodomy is true. defined as just putting something in there. Okay. Okay. So so maybe. Maybe part of the torture. Which just, it certainly could have been. Yeah. Okay. Ugh. All right. Well, Mark was then led out to a field where Adolfo tortured him some more and then chopped the back of his head and neck with a machete, which ultimately killed Mark. God. His skull was split open and his brains his brains were scooped out and then boiled in the naganga. His legs were chopped off above his knees to facilitate in burial. And then a wire was inserted into his spinal column so that once the body had decomposed, the bones could be pulled up from the soil easily and made into a necklace they could wear. The cult members then dug a hole in the ground and buried Mark's body. It's a lot. That's like... It's fucking awful. It is. And that scenario, like somebody goes missing, that is beyond any worst case scenario anyone was thinking of. Yes. It's like so beyond anything you could have imagined. Yes. I can't imagine. I just like walking into that. They must have been like, Mm -hmm. fuck. So after the investigators uncovered everything at the ranch the next day, April 12th, the detainees were taken to the headquarters of the Mexican Federal Judicial Police in Matamoros for an informal press conference. More than 250 international journalists arrived at the scene to take pictures and ask them questions. Fuck yeah, they did. The four suspects were paraded from the building's balcony and were allowed to answer questions from reporters. Elio Hernandez Rivera stated that he was an ordained executioner under Costanzo and that Costanzo himself had murdered Mark. As the camera zoomed in on the suspects, Elio showed his membership scars on his shoulders, back, and arms, and chest. There were, uh, these were arrow-like cuts made with a hot blade. Uh, the marks were given to selected cult members with the authority to perform human sacrifice. This just sounds like he's bragging. Yeah. Which is so much worse. He's I like, know. hey, look, I was, I was one of the few that could do this. Mm-hmm. Fuck you, dude. So they had these four in custody, but they were really looking for the godfather and the mother. Yeah. Um, and those closest to them. A paper trail would confirm that on April 11th, 1989, the day the bodies were ex- exhumed from Santa Elena, Adolfo fled to a Holiday Inn in Brownsville before flying from McAllen, Texas to Mexico City, where he had an apartment. He escaped with Sarah Ald- Aldrett, uh, Martin Quintana Rodriguez, Omar Francisco Oria Oka, and Alvaro de Leon Valdez. Uh, so, and again, I am so sorry. <laughs> so let's discuss Adolfo a bit. Because let's do. He has a crazy life. Um, Adolfo Costanzo, Adolfo de Jesus Costanzo, was born in Miami, Florida to Delia Aurora Gonzalez, a Cuban immigrant in 1962. She gave birth to Adolfo at the age of 15 and eventually had three children by different fathers. Delia moved to San Juan, Puerto Rico after her first husband died and remarried there. Adolfo was baptized Catholic and served as an altar boy, but also accompanied his mother on trips to Haiti to learn about voodoo. Adolfo and his family returned to Miami in 1972. At 14, he was a local sorcerer's apprentice. There you go. And began to practice a religion called Palomeo. 
sorry, Palo Mayombe, which involves animal sacrifice. He really took to the teachings of rituals. His mother believed her son might be the chosen one to be the leader in this religion. Hey. This really got to Adolfo's head. Uh, Delio remarried and his new father, his new stepfather was involved in both the religion and drug dealing. Costanzo and his mother were arrested numerous times for theft, vandalism, and shoplifting. As an adult, Costanzo moved to Mexico City and met the men uh, who were to become his followers. That was Martin Quintana, uh, Jorge Montes, and Omar Oria. They began to run a profitable business, uh, casting spells to bring good luck, which involved expensive ritual sacrifices of chickens, goats, snakes, zebras, and even lion cubs. Oh. I know. Many of his clients were rich drug dealers and hitmen who enjoyed the violence of Adolfo's magical displays. He also attracted other rich members of Mexican society, including several high-ranking corrupt policemen who introduced him to the city's powerful drug cartels. Though he was successful, the drug cartels' higher-ups never saw him as their equal, so he decided to leave them behind and try to start his own thing, something that he could control. Lucky for him, his followers were also in love with him and his, and his gifts, so they continued to follow him and helped him bring in new members. Mm. He then met Sarah, a young American student who fell for Adolfo's good, uh, good looks, his charisma, and his charm. And she was easily indoctrinated into his clan, where he made her his high priestess, the godmother of his cult. She then introduced him to the Hernandez family. She knew she probably, from what I can gather, she probably knew uh, Seraphine, who was the one that lived in Mexico. So he was one of the Hernandez boys that was on the American side. Sorry, he lived in um, America, in, uh, in Texas. So she was going to college there. She probably met him. She might have known him because he was dealing drugs. So maybe she was getting marijuana from him. Oh, my God. The, Mex the, the, the American police were probably like, fuck, there are Americans. I know. I know. And so she she knew that um, he, sued, he sold drugs and thought that his family could benefit from the witchcraft and wizardry of Adolfo. Oh, no. <laughs> so, Not wizardry. The, so Adolfo and his members started to raid graveyards for human bones to put in the, the naganga or the cauldron. Uh, before long, he decided that the spirits of the dead that resided in the Naganga would be stronger, providing the cult more powerful protection with live human sacrifices instead of old bones. The resulting killing soon totaled more than 20 victims with whose mutilated bodies were found in and around Mexico City. All but Mark's bodies were rival gang dealers. Mm. So now... The U.S. and Mexican law enforcement agencies. Oh, yeah. Well, I say I just need to take a moment. He had like a crazy life. Like, still, there is no excuse for that behavior. No, that, but that's what I mean. Just yeah. like I just, it's like uh, nobody should be the chosen one. No, but everybody who thinks they're the chosen one ends up. But that's having what some I mean. Really horrible yeah. tendencies. It's awful. So now the U.S. and Mexican law enforcement agencies carried out an international manhunt to locate Adolfo and the rest of his cult members. Yeah, you got to find them quick. The police believed that he had possibly fed, fled to Miami to visit his mother or to Houston, where he had links to a $20 million cocaine operation that had been busted a year earlier. But Adolfo opted for Mexico City, where he hid with several of his followers for short periods of time. Elio told police about two apartments in Mexico City that belonged to Adolfo. On April 17th in Mexico City, the police raided one of these apartments. They discovered piles of homosexual pornography and a hidden ritual chamber and an altar inside. So uh, a cult leader with a deep secret of homosexuality? Oh, that never happens. What? Weird. So weird. Oh, boy. Investigators sought to check out the gay communities at this point. They were like, oh, well, God. okay. Oh, God. Um, but they, they couldn't find anything there. No one knew anything. Back at the apartment, they found some of Sarah's belongings that were arranged to look like maybe Adolfo had killed her. Um, but no one was believing it. I bet he didn't. <laughs> yeah. Over the next few weeks, following leads and receipts, they were able to arrest several more followers, hoping that they were getting closer to finding Adolfo and Sarah. 
they decided to hold a stunt to draw him out from hiding. Ooh. They went back to the ranch and performed a cleansing ceremony on the property by essentially burning down the shack to ashes. No. <laughs> well, this was ah. fine. They had already, but they had already done everything at this point. Like All they already, right. This was like. It just feels like they're burning down evidence. Well, but they had already collected all that they could. All right. So. uh, (laughs) Still. I I know. After the whole trial is over, yes, burn it to the fucking ground. Nobody should be go murder touristing there. I know. I know. But I guess they collected what they thought and then they were like, we need to get him out. And he fucking cares about this Nagang. All right. Fair enough. He cares about it. Uh, So um, they. They threw salt to cleanse and they destroyed the cauldron while burning a photo of Adolfo in it. They laid a they cross. They really went they hard. Did, they okay. did. They laid a cross on top of the ashes of the uh, shack as well. Um, the entire stunt was photographed and put in the papers far and wide. They wanted him to see this. This is kind of wild. Yeah. I don't know that it did anything. I think he was like, this, this sucks. And then <laughs> just like. They were like, we put on a whole show. I know. After consulting local witches and sorcerers, police were pretty sure they knew where he was in Mexico and in Mexico City. They had gotten reports of a woman looking like Sarah walking around. Then police were called in for a man with pink hair using American money to buy a large amount of groceries. A man with pink hair. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And he was around that same area where they thought they saw Sarah walking around. Mm -hmm. They followed him to his apartment. They believed he was the one... One of the wanted cult members, um, which was Alvaro de Leon Valdez, they staked the place out for about a week. At Mm -hmm. around 2 p.m. on May 6th, four undercover detectives pulled up to the apartment with intent to raid once the traffic in the area died down, but then saw an unmarked vehicle parked outside. They walked over to investigate and Adolfo, who was hiding out in the apartment, (gasps) noticed the police from the window and opened fire Uh. at the officers who were at ground level. Adolfo then threw golden coins and paper money from his window (laughs) and burned some of his money on the stove. And I think this was his way of like trying to like appease the gods. Like he was like throwing it out for the gods to like protect him. He was like, maybe the police will take this and I can run away. He was like yelling shit at them. Like, oh, it was wild. Lord. 180 police officers had descended onto the scene. It was, a, it was a wild time. Yeah, that's nuts. Shots were firing everywhere. Store windows were shattering. People and officers were running around collecting the paper money. Because <laughs> they <Yeah, money. laughs> Adolfo eventually ran out of ammunition and began to lose his patience. He's like, I'm just so over this. Ugh. After about 45 minutes and Worrying and worried about his imminent capture, Adolfo ordered De Leon to kill him and Quintana Rodriguez, assuming <sighs> they would all be resurrected. Re- <laughs> assuming they would all be resurrected, De Leon shot them both and then himself. Sarah and another fugitive ran out of the apartment with their arms up to surrender. She told them Adolfo was dead. The police ran inside to see if she was telling the truth, and she was. Um, a total of 14 cult members were charged with a range of crimes from murder to uh, drug running to obstructing the justice, uh, the court of justice. Sarah, Elio, and Seraphim were convicted of multiple, of multiple murders and were ordered to serve prison sentences of over 60 years each. De Leon was given a 30-year term. If, the, if Sarah is ever released from prison, the American authorities plan to prosecute her for the murder of Mark. There are still two suspects at large. Jesus. I know. So two months after Mark was confirmed dead, his parents founded the Mark Kilroy Foundation, which promotes drug awareness, education, and prevention through the Just Say No campaign. Since Mark's dream was to become a doctor after college, his parents decided to help others and continue his dream through this program. Since 1994, the foundation has sponsored and worked alongside Substance Abuse Free Environment, or SAFE, a nonprofit community group that promotes awareness for substance abuse and drug prevention. Aww. One thing that I just realized I never mentioned yes. is that Several times during this investigation, this is my final thing because okay. I'm, I'm so mad that I didn't bring it in the into it. But 
During this investigation, the suspects made references to a a 1987 horror film, The Believers. Okay. Starring Martin Sheen and directed by John Schlesinger. The film is about a cult in New York City that conducts human sacrifices to gain money and power. And Elio and the others said that Sarah had organized screenings of the movie and that they had watched it many times. A subsequent search of Sarah's bedroom in her parents' house um, in Matamoros turned up. Oh, because, okay, so she had uh, her parents also lived in Matamoros. So that's how she was like going back and forth. But in her room, she had like a makeshift altar of black candles, beaded necklaces and cigars uh, near a blood splattered wall. Of course she did. Yeah. But I just think it's so crazy that like Adolfo just loved this movie. And that's like what he was basing this or did, cult did of. she did she introduce them to this movie? So she came in and she was like, guys, you know what? I really watch this movie. Maybe. I really think you could do something with this. Maybe. Isn't that isn't that crazy? That right? is nuts. Also, I think we should do this movie for maybe a 30 minute sure. horror. But I because I actually was looking at it. It's also um I think it's written by Mark Frost, who does Twin Peaks. Oh, nice. So I actually okay. think it's a good movie. Well, then let's watch that movie. But this is, it's it's going to be hard watching it now, I think, well, because yeah. if this movie was such a big inspiration to them. Yeah, it's going to be really weird and uncomfortable, yeah. but still. But I just, it's so typical in cults like this where you find out that it's something so fucking Based stupid. on like a movie or something. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. They're all like super fans of some yeah. weird thing that they saw and pictured themselves being. Yes. Yeah. Also, um, those who practice Santeria or the Palo Mayon Bay have yeah. come forward during, like, especially when all this was coming out. And yeah. we're just like, we don't do this shit. Yeah. This was, this no. was fucked up. This guy was an asshole. No, no, yeah. no. Santeria, worst case scenario, you got some dead chickens on your hand. Mm-hmm. But like, uh, most of us eat chickens, so. Yeah. yeah, so I am going to, that was the story. That's just crazy. I got most of my facts from there were wiki art articles, Rolling Stone articles. Um, there's there's uh, so New much York material. Times. I have so much. I'm gonna post everything on there. Um, one of the podcasts I had listened to was um, Case File, episode 123. Got some of um, some of that from him. He had a a large amount of sightings for his like resources that yeah. he found. So I actually went through most of his as well, but. Yeah, if you guys this want to uh, learn more on this one, there is a world of things you could tap into. There's like, I think it was on all of, I mean, like pick a crime show. It yeah. was on it. It was on it. Yeah. I also am going to have a link to a article that I read that in 2004, they mm-hmm. interviewed Sarah while she was in prison. Oh. And so there's like some information about her. So I'm going to throw that in there for you as like an update of like what's going on Did with her. Did you listen to any of that? Um, It was just an article. So I read it. Is it weird? Ew. Kind of. She's is like, she at least apologetic? She or? is. Okay. She's just like, I was clearly brainwashed. Okay. Um, But she's been in prison at that point for 15 years. So she's got a long way to go. Yeah. Well, I mean, fine. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the parents have all but forgiven most of the cult members because wow. they are also aware they they want them all in prison. They of think course. they all deserve to be there, um, because they don't trust them to be on the streets no. anymore. But they have in their hearts like forgiven them, and okay. also I think they feel like they were brainwashed into yeah. like this crazy cult. But they also find them to still be dangerous, like members of society. Oh yeah. So. I mean, they did that stuff, so they're capable of it. Yeah. There's, you can't ever deny that. But yeah, that was the case. Thank you, Leslie. Man, that felt longer than I thought it was going to be. They always are. I don't know how anybody <laughs> covers this in less than an hour. I, I thought I left. About. I know. I thought that I did. No. <laughs> Wild. No, I hear you. I, I often think that, too. I'm like, how? What did you cut out? <laughs> Is it just that I can't not set scenes and go on <laughs> tangents? That makes it to, better. I had to talk about South Padre. Well, yeah, but like, as, okay, so that's also our thing. And as a, when I'm reading about these things, when it's me on the other side, yeah, I always find that stuff so interesting. Yeah. I always want to know, like, where are they? What is it like there? How did mm-hmm. it, you know? Like, I needed to know all about this Naganga. Of course. Because I felt like that was pertinent. 
It is pertinent. A hundred percent it's pertinent. You're lucky. You're to be frank, you're very lucky that I didn't cover this case. Yeah. Cause I would have been like, let me break down these religions for you. Yeah. I'll go into all of them. Do you want me to tell you all the rules of Santeria? I have them all now. Yeah. That's that's you're what would have happened. Guys. I know, right? Yeah. You would have had like a three part episode on <laughs> all the different religions. Yeah. But that was that was the case. Good job, Leslie. <gasps> Thank you. That one is brutal. Yeah, that was a lot bigger than I thought it was going to be. It is, and it's very... Because it has, like, different turns. The headline is always like, Satanic cult murders Taurus. But it's, like, Mm -hmm. so much more than that because the drug cartel is in there, and, like, Mm -hmm. it's just a lot. Yeah. And there... It it is. It's, like, two stories because then you also have this whole cult Mm -hmm. leader. And when you look into his specific cult, it's a backyard cult. Yeah. It's a little cultlet. Yeah. It was just this like small group of people. It was like him and 14 other people. Exactly. So like you can't even really go full into this quote unquote cult because it was was so small and just cherry picked, like you said, from other religions. However, had they not caught him, Mm -hmm. who the hell else, who knows what else would have happened? He was only 26. So I think about that and I'm like, sometimes you find these cult leaders and they're in their 40s, 50s, 60s. So, yes, a lot of them can go on forever, especially if they're in remote areas. Yeah. Nobody's telling on them. I mean, really, it's never going to be OK what yeah. happened to Mark Kilroy. But if it hadn't been him specifically, yeah. they probably would have never found them. I know. Or at least not for a while. Yeah. Crazy. Just so wild. Also, the um, cult leader looks so much like one of my college boyfriends. It's yeah. Yeah. It's I mean, that's the thing. He is he is he is fairly good looking. Yeah. And Sarah was fairly good looking. And if he um, didn't, if, if you like cut off his like 1980s mullet, mm-hmm. he would look like a guy dated in college. Very, yeah. very much. Mm-hmm. Wild. Maybe, maybe it was him. Maybe it was him. <laughs> Doubtful. I don't think so. All right. Toast. Yeah. To, to Mark. Yeah, obviously. To Helen. To Jim. To Keith. To all the Kilroys. Yeah. And to the three Bs. Yes. Who did everything right? Yeah. And to Ken. Ken Kilroy. (laughs) Oh, Ken. And if we answered the call of a stranger in a car, we we would would be dead. dead. Thank you for listening to the We Would Be Dead podcast. Hit subscribe now to never miss an episode. Rate and review our show on iTunes. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Would Be Dead Pod and join our Facebook group to discuss the podcast and more. Get out your guns in holy water.